right into it. Um, I have been uh, with Ross and AUC for, for about two years now. Um, and uh, I was up in the Pacific Northwest and then uh, just recently actually moved down here to Orange County. So uh, I'm just, just down the road from IDC um, and very happy to be here. Um, so both schools, I'll just I'll go ahead and get into it. Both schools are uh, four-year MD programs, and they're both international schools located down in the Caribbean. Um, and uh, so Ross is located on the island of Barbados. AUC is located on the island of St. Martin. Here is my, my contact information. I'll have it up again at the end as well, but feel free to take a picture of that, take a screenshot. Uh, feel free to email me if you do have any questions or anything like that. Uh, I'd be more than happy to, to answer any if you do have anything kind of specific at the end. Uh, so this first slide here um, is really just kind of getting into some information that we should already kind of all know, right? Uh, which ultimately is that it's very difficult to get into U.S. Uh, medical school programs, you know, specifically U.S. Uh, you know, MD programs. Uh, and this just shows the U.S. Uh, medical school matriculants um, from from 21, 22, uh, and what their average GPAs, average average MCATs were, and kind of no matter where you are in your educational journey, you know that you know what your GPA is and kind of know what you're aiming for. Um, and then of course, you know what MCAT score uh, you're aiming for as well, whether you've taken practice exams or, or uh, you've studied for the MCAT or, or maybe you've already taken the MCAT, but whatever it might be, uh, you kind of know uh, what, what your MCAT score is. And uh, this, this GPA and MCAT score, uh, it, it's very high, very competitive um, and very tough to achieve uh, both of those scores. Um, so ultimately, again, this just shows that it is very difficult to get into US uh, MD programs. Uh, and that's kind of where Ross and AUC um, come in. We have uh, a, a slightly different approach when it comes to admissions. Uh, we take a very holistic approach when looking at applicants. And uh, we, the way we kind of do that is by interviewing a lot more applicants than, than many other schools. Um, there's certain, you know, certain classes, certain cycles where we actually end up interviewing uh, a majority of applicants within that given cycle. So um, that's kind of the way we really do exemplify uh, and show that we are uh, trying to dig deeper than, you know, beyond just the MCAT number and beyond the GPA number. Um, we want to really get to know you. We want to speak to you uh, and we want to have that interview, have that chance to, to talk to you. So um, our admissions team, I, I work with them very closely. Uh, they'll be the ones, you know, scheduling your virtual interviews with you that, and they'll be the same person you'll have been working with for the, for the previous couple of weeks uh, to make sure you had your transcripts, make sure you had your transcripts, your letters of rec. Uh, your personal statement, all that kind of stuff. So uh, it's going to be someone that you at least have a little bit of familiarity with, um, and uh, they're not trying to get you or anything like that. They're trying to really just get to know you and have that conversation. Uh, so again, we're just trying to dig deeper and take that holistic approach when it comes to applicants. So because of that, um, our average incoming GPA and average uh, incoming MCAT score is going to be a little bit lower than what you saw on the previous slide. But the awesome thing is that uh, it doesn't uh, it doesn't uh, hurt our outcomes or affect our outcomes at all, right? Uh, we feel that these numbers here, the first time residency match rate and, and step one pass rate, um, they really do show that we are doing things the right way with admissions, right? Um, we are choosing the the right students to participate in our program, um, and we're sort of selecting the correct applicants. Uh, so as you can see here, in 2022, uh, AUC matched at 96 percent. Uh, for a first time residency match rate across 19 different specialties, right? So uh, it's not just family or internal, although if that's what you're looking for, we certainly do match there uh, a ton as well. Um, but we do have, uh, you know, everything from neurology to anesthesiology, you know, the really competitive specialties um, that the students are looking for. Um, and our students, again, are able to match into those specialties year in and year out. Of course, the 2023 match just happened here a couple of weeks ago. And so we're very proud to announce that both uh, AUC uh, and Ross matched at 97%. Uh, between the two schools, we matched into 45 different states uh, and into 29 different specialties. So again, uh, you're not at a disadvantage by, by coming down to the Caribbean. Um, and our numbers kind of back that up, that students are matching all over the country um, and into a ton of different specialties each and every year. Uh, you can see the numbers here for Ross, uh, kind of a more detailed look at 2022. Um, Ross's class sizes are, are generally larger than AUC's, which is why that raw number of matches is going to be larger, uh, but still the same percentage, uh, 96% in 2022, and again, 97% in 2023. So we love that our students are able, uh, when, when going back head-to-head -head with U.S. students, 
were able to wrestle away some of those spots uh, and match into all kinds of different specialties. So how each of our programs are kind of set up, right, is, uh, is going to be your first two years are done down on island. Um, so Ross and AUC, while they're owned by the same company, that's kind of where the partnership ends. Uh, they do have separate campuses, separate faculties, separate admissions processes, all that kind of stuff. And in fact, they are even on separate islands. Um, so again, like I mentioned at the beginning, Ross is on the island of Barbados, AUC on the island of St. Martin. Um, so the first 20 months of the program, the first five semesters, that's going to class, working with, with, working with professors, going to lecture, taking tests, all your medical sciences, right? Um, and so again, that's the only part of our program that is actually done down in the Caribbean. Um, after those first 20 months, then you're going to be coming back here to the U.S. to take your USMLE Step 1, uh, which about 92-ish percent of our students pass each year. Um, and then, of course, you're going to be moving on to your core and elective rotations. Now, the cool thing about our program is those are all done here in the U.S. Uh, and, and AUC actually does have some options uh, to do rotations in the U.K. as well. Um, so the cool thing about having rotations all over the country um, is that it gives you the chance to meet a lot of different physicians, see a lot of different hospitals, and ultimately you're kind of auditioning for residency at a ton of different uh, locations. Um, so we have sites uh, in LA, in Bakersfield, New York, Miami, Chicago, and kind of everywhere in between, between the two schools, uh, about 30 different partner hospitals all over the country. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, most of our alumni love that aspect of our program that you're able to move around. Um, there's some alumni that I've spoken to that said, uh, you know, they strategically chose their hospitals to do rotations as hospitals they wanted to end up matching into for residency, right? Um, and so they got the opportunity to go there during the rotations, show off, you know, how much of a hard worker they are uh, and how, 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 uh, how great their skills are. Um, and then, of course, when it comes to that residency interview, you're able to, to touch upon those and, and say, actually, you know, I was already in your hospital. Maybe you already even know me. So uh, it is a super cool and unique part of our program. Um, and of course, once you finish up year four, again, you're moving into residency just like any other medical school student um, here in the U.S. or anywhere else, you know, internationally. So just a little bit uh, about our campus um, and kind of what you can come to expect down on island. Uh, so I'm not going to go through each one of these right now, but uh, the main the main uh, point here in terms of you know high tech hands on learning um, is our uh, our, our Sectra virtual dissection tapes, right? Um, so this is uh, as opposed to using actual cadavers. Uh, most of our alumni talk about that. Uh, they really did enjoy the opportunity and they felt that they learned a lot more uh, by using the virtual dissection tables as opposed to cadavers. Um, just because, uh, of course, if you make a mistake uh, with a cadaver, you can't go in and undo that, right? Um, they felt they were able to get a lot more, uh, a lot more practice in uh, and uh, get a lot more uh, done using the, the tables as opposed to using actual cadavers. Uh, now, if you are looking for cadavers and you really do want them to be a part of your medical school journey, uh, AUC still does have cadavers in addition to the uh, dissection tables, uh, while Ross has moved away from cadavers uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, something else that we're also very proud about uh, is, or proud of, I should say, uh, is that our clinical training uh, starts first semester. Um, it's kind of a two-pronged approach how we do that. Um, number one is going to be our hands-on uh, uh, learning experiences out in the community. Um, so specifically with Ross on the island of Barbados, um, there's a number of different opportunities uh, to go and, and help underserved populations, right? There are parts of the island that are more underserved. Uh, and so we love that we have the opportunity uh, to, to give our students the chance to go out uh, and whether it be a pop-up clinic, whether it be uh, helping with COVID testing, uh, helping with a COVID vaccine rollout. There are all kinds of different opportunities for students um, to go out into the community and kind of get that hands-on learning, right? Uh, number two uh, is going to be our simulation center. Um, on both campuses, both Ross and AUC, uh, we have an entire floor of campus that is set up to mimic a hospital. Um, you have a number of different rooms um, that each have their own sim mannequin or high fidelity patient simulator. Uh, that uh, they, those can, they can breathe, they can bleed, they can actually speak to you through a speaker in their mouth. Um, they're, they're super high tech and, and also very expensive, uh, but they give you a great opportunity uh, to go and, and really work with a patient, right? Um, you get the chance to go through different scenarios and whether it be, uh, you know, an eight-year-old child or, or an 85-year-old uh, elderly person, you're able to go through 
and uh, and try different scenarios. And I've talked to alumni that said they were in there all the time. They were in there multiple times a week, uh, honing those skills and not only you know the hard skills, the the book knowledge, but also uh, you know making sure their bed they're working on their bedside manner and all that kind of stuff as well. So really does give you the opportunity to become more uh, well rounded before you can get back to your rotations in the U.S. And other than that, uh, we just have so much support for all of our students down on island. Um, so whether that be uh, academic support, uh, whether that be hey I need you know mental health counseling. Uh, I, I would love to know, you know, what what rotations I'm going to be doing, and I want to set those up right away uh, back in the United States. Um, so there's just so many different offices that uh, it's their job to help you all along the way. I'll just walk you quickly through what it would be like to go through our, our program and kind of what support is there. So when you first apply, you'll be put in contact with one of our admissions team members. Uh, it's their job to make sure you have everything you need. Uh, from beginning to end, right? All your transcripts, all that kind of stuff. And like I said at the beginning, they'll be the ones to conduct your interview with you. Uh, once uh, once you finish up with them, uh, then you'll be moving on to all of your core uh, and or then you'll be moving on to uh, everything down on island, right? With one of our new student coordinators. Um, and uh, they're the ones who will help you every step along the way throughout that process to get you down to island. Once you're down on island, there's kind of the same offices I'm sure you have at IVC, right? All that high quality support, again, mental health counseling, uh, you know, clinical or, uh, rotations about what you're going to be planning for your rotations back in the United States, all that kind of stuff. And then once you're doing your rotations, you have a person at each and every site uh, that it's their job to help you uh, if you have any questions or anything like that back in the United States. So every step along the way, there's so much support and, and everything you could possibly need down on the island. And here is just briefly where uh, each campus is located uh, in relation to the United States. Uh, both islands are English speaking. Uh, they accept the US dollar um, and it's, it's very easy to get down there. Um, you can fly from LA to the East Coast and down. There's a number of different sites that fly to and from uh, both St. Martin and Barbados to the United States. And now that we've finished up our first two years down on islands, now these are the rotations that you'd be doing here in the United States. Uh, this is uh, pretty standard, as probably you would see with, with most medical schools um, here in the U.S. Um, and of course, the year four, you get to kind of pick and choose which rotations you want to do. Um, and um, it gives you the opportunity to really hone in on the residency specialty that you're hoping to match into. Here are uh, most of our hospitals uh, where we have those rotation sites. Um, again, year four, this list does expand out a little bit more, uh, but this is generally where you'd be for year three. Um, you get to pick and choose you know, how much you wanna move if you kinda wanna stay in one general area. It depends on, on your situation uh, and, and what you're looking to do. And then here are some of our residency highlights from 2022, uh, just showing the, the diversity of different experiences, uh, you know, all, all across the, the country that our, our students were able to match into uh, and all the hospitals they were able to match into as well. Um, again, uh, in 2023, uh, we were able to match into 45 different hospitals or different, uh, different states all across the country. And uh, with this map and, and the map on the next slide, uh, the main takeaway should be uh, that number one, we have a huge alumni network. And number two, we have graduates practicing in all 50 states, right? Um, so not only are you able to gain licensure, uh, but students have done it year in and year out. Um, and you can see just here in California between the two schools, over 1800 graduates. Um, so uh, if you are looking to come back to California, if that is where your home is, um, you certainly are able to do that with either Ross or AUC. And something else we're very, very proud of uh, is our diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, that uh, we graduate more uh, Black physicians, male and female, than any other U.S. school. Um, and just the general diversity down on uh, on campus, right? No matter who you are, what your background is, uh, there are other students down on island with similar background, similar experiences. Uh, so we love uh, love to champion that diversity um, down on on each island. And then uh, just wrapping up here uh, shortly, uh, just kind of the, the points that are probably most relevant to where you are in your educational journey, uh, kind of what we're looking at from applicants. So of course, we're going to require the MCAT uh, and we are going to look at your GPA, but those aren't the only two things we're going to look at, right? Like if they said at the beginning, we take that holistic approach when looking at applicants. Uh, we require a bachelor's degree with, with these couple of, of prereqs. Um, but uh, nothing too out of the ordinary there for anyone looking at, 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 uh, at, at taking a pre-med track or anything like that. Uh, and then we do require two letters of recommendation 
uh, one personal statement, which is going to be about a page or a page and a half. Um, and then that medically related experience down at the bottom is something we really, uh, really do uh, weigh very heavily. Uh, we want to see that not only do you have shadowing hours, but um, you also have some other, uh, you know, different, uh, different medically related experiences out there, whether that be being a medical scribe, CNA, EMT, volunteerism, all that kind of stuff is all great stuff and all stuff that we want to see. And that's what they're going to ask you about in that personal interview um, when uh, when they're speaking to you and, and trying to get a sense of really who you are um, and if you'd be a good fit for our program. We do have three different start dates. Uh, we have January, May, and September every single year. Uh, we also have rolling admissions throughout the year. Um, so you're able to, uh, our, our May class is obviously just getting seated here over the next couple of weeks. Um, but once they do get all settled, uh, we'll be opening up our May 2024 applications. Uh, and you are still able to apply for September of 2023, and then of course, January of 24 right now. So uh, we usually have three windows open at a time um, to kind of the next three uh, upcoming. Um, the cool thing about January or May is it gives a lot more flexibility uh, into your four year timeline, right? If you start in September, you really do have to go back to back to back for your rotations if you wanna make your match year. Whereas if you start in January or May, you have a little extra time built in, uh, if you want to, uh, you know, take a week off between rotations, go see family, anything like that, uh, there is that added flexibility. Uh, we have three decision possibilities. So one is going to be acceptance, of course. Uh, the second is denial. We're going to continue to work with you, let you know how you can improve your application. And last is MERP, which stands for our Medical Education Readiness Program. It's a one semester fully online program um, that if you pass MERP, you're automatically moving on to the following semester one. Uh, if you don't pass MERP, uh, then uh, your tuition for the program is refunded. Um, so it gives you the opportunity to, to prove that you're ready for, for medical school. Um, and it's a great, great opportunity for our students uh, to get into uh, either Ross or AUC. And then lastly is the financial piece. Uh, so we know the medical school is very expensive, uh, but we have so many different uh, you know, scholarships available, uh, both need-based, merit-based. I'll show those briefly on the next slide. But the other cool thing about Ross and AUC that's unique to international programs uh, is that our accrediting bodies are both fully recognized by the U.S. Department of Education. And that's only important because that means you're able to take out the same kind of government loans uh, that students would uh, for, for you know, programs here uh, in the U.S. or maybe you did for, for undergrad. Here are uh, just a, a few of those scholarships uh, for you to take a look at. Like I said, we're trying to try to cut down your cost of tuition as much as we can with a number of these different scholarships, need-based, merit-based, first-time college graduate, all that kind of stuff. And then I will go ahead and, and wrap up with this. And of course, we'll be taking questions uh, at the end. Um, but uh, just a couple different reasons to choose Ross and AUC. Uh, number one is going to be those extensive alumni networks. Uh, as you saw on, on both of those maps for, for each school, um, is that we have graduates in all 50 states and a lot of them, right? Again, just in California, over 1,800 graduates um, between the two schools. So people know about Ross, people know about AUC. Uh, the commitment to physician diversity, like I'd mentioned, uh, we know there's a shortage of minority physicians. So we love that we're doing our part to, to hopefully close that gap. Uh, and number three is the competitive residency match rate, right? Uh, no matter which school you're looking at, whether it be uh, a Caribbean school, another international school, or a school here in the U.S., you want to make sure they can match you into residency, right? Um, so that's uh, one of the most important things to look at uh, is that residency match rate. Make sure that the school you choose, they can get you to where you want to go at the end of your four years. And then lastly, it is just another opportunity to pursue your MD, right? I always tell students, if you get into your dream medical school just down the street from home, by all means, you know, go to that program, right? Uh, but if you don't get into that dream medical school, uh, that doesn't mean you have to give up on your medical school dream of becoming a physician, right? There are other programs out there. There are other options out there like Ross, like at UC, they can ultimately get you to the same place. So if you guys wouldn't mind uh, just scanning the QR code here, um, I, it, uh, there's some great webinars that we host all throughout the year um, that, that are great for all pre-med students. And it also lets my boss know I was here doing my job. So we'd really appreciate it if you wouldn't mind scanning that real quick. Um, but uh, but with that, I'll go ahead and, and I'll turn it over to you, Luke, um, and, and, uh, and let you take it away. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, my name is Luke Rao. I'm representing Western University of Health Sciences. 
I'm on the Oregon campus, um, but it's one program with two sites. You guys are probably more familiar with uh, Comp Pomona down there. So I'll do a presentation, talk about both um, and highlight a few differences. The presentation I'm using is from last year. I did not have time to update it since yesterday, um, but I will fill in a few numbers that have changed and keep you guys updated on what else is out there. <laughs> okay, um, you guys welcome. So Western Universe Health Sciences started in 1978. Uh, we have about 20 different health science programs now. Um, you guys are familiar with Comp Pomona has 220 seats per year. And then 12 years ago, uh, the Lebanon campus opened up and that has 100 uh, students per year. So I will focus a little more on the DOMD kind of side of things in that a lot of the information you just heard, honestly, will be similar from one med school to the next. So there's probably more than 250 med schools to choose from out there right now, of which 64 or roughly 25% are osteopathic medical schools. Either route gets you to any specialty field you wish. Uh, DO schools on average graduate about 10% more uh, graduates into primary care, but I don't believe either route is necessarily a better choice. It's just finding the fit uh, for you and the flavor, I guess, en route to your residency pathway. Um, osteopathic manipulative medicine. So why does the U.S. have DO and MD as a choice? I think other countries usually just have one degree for becoming a physician. Um, you can go back to a gentleman named A.T. Steele, Andrew Taylor Steele. He was an MD during the Civil War period, and he loved to put things back together. He was known as a lightning bone setter. Um, so basically, he was practicing medicine at a time when pharmaceuticals and surgical procedures both had limitations. He recognized that the use of whiskey or mercury or cocaine had some benefits, but also harms. Um, he saw the surgical procedures of amputation, a Civil War movie, and bloodletting, and learning about infections. You know, it was kind of 50-50 chance it was going to help or harm the patient. He saw that when the body is put together correctly, things kind of function correctly. He realized as a lightning bone setter that there were some things you could do with your hands. So he ends up developing, developing a technique that he calls osteopathic manipulative treatment. He opens up his own medical school and it became the first DO, Doctor of Osteopathy program in the nation. It still exists um, today. So if you go to a DO school, you are getting the same science of medic medicine education you'll find at other medical schools. And you are learning to develop your hands as a diagnostic tool. Half of DOs will use it in practice, half won't, but you are going to be more comfortable around the human body. You're going to have more time around patients and kind of the personal side of medicine. And one belief AT still had was let's train physicians to treat patients, not disease. And it's not saying MD schools don't do this. Uh, the DO schools just have a little more history with making it a focus of their med school careers. Um, that being said, when you graduate from an MD or DO school, you're going to apply to the same residency programs. You're going to be working side by side. Uh, there's, there's more you can learn on OMT. And that's the physical class difference. And then I think it's just a little bit of the people, uh, the exam skills can be a little different from a DO school to MD school, but you'll be working side by side. Patients may or may not know which you are. Um, but it's pretty amazing when you learn some of the things you can do with that. And if you have q and A in a few minutes, we can kind of top it, uh, touch on some examples. So I think I mentioned sorry history of um, the university opened in seventy seven. Um, turned into Western University after being just a medical school for the first uh, two decades. Um, Comp Northwest opened in two thousand eleven, and we now have a PT program up in the Oregon site and OT coming on board too. So you have two campuses to choose from from the DO side, medical school side, is the same program, two campuses, same offerings, just small town Pacific Northwest versus kind of the larger city SoCal location. Um, the differences come from the community involvement, location you're at, um, community partners. When you are looking at DO schools, you are applying through ACOMAS, A-A-C-O-M-A-S, uh, MD schools through AMCAS. Um, general cycle is about the same. So for DO schools, it will open up the first week of May. This was last year's information, but it really hasn't changed. You apply the first week of May. Um, 
shortly thereafter, the schools you have selected will receive your primary application from the application surface once it's been processed. They then invite you to do a secondary application, which includes a couple extra essays. It may include the CASPER. We do. Some schools do not. And then once you have um, your primary application complete, your secondary application complete, letters of recommendation, CASPER, then if all is well, you will kind of move on to the eligible to interview category. Um, we're going to interview from about September all the way through April to start the following August. So the process to apply for most people begins about one year prior to starting in August each year, but you can apply all the way kind of to the winter break a little after a uh, period. Uh, prerequisites, they honestly align almost exactly with what you just heard, so I'm not going to touch on them. We do not have the math prereq, but we do have a behavioral sciences. So that's the only thing different from the presentation you guys just watched. Other requirements, you have to have your bachelor's degree before you can matriculate, but not when you apply. Um, you have to take the MCAT. For us, you need a 500 or above, really, to continue with the secondary application process. Um, we require two letters of recommendation. Um, MD or DO is fine. If you don't have a DO letter recommendation, I just say there's a little more weight upon you elsewhere in the application to explain why going to an osteopathic school might be right for you. Um, you also look for a one science professor letter or committee letter. Um, some differences about the university, not necessarily the college, but the university. Our entire campus deals with uh, interprofessional education. So we have the DO program, we have uh, pharmacy, optometry, PT, PA, et cetera. We have a program where you are going to sit down with other health science students from those colleges and look at case studies together during your first two years. Uh, the concept being exposing you to how other health professions think and work before you get out to those third and fourth year clinical years. So you're kind of a better partner. Um, you are expected to be service oriented all the way through any programs at Western U. And so you'll be involved with community partnerships. I am more familiar with the Oregon campus. We can touch on that shortly thereafter. Uh, we do have a patient care center, but we partner with hospitals in the area, Arrowhead, uh, Pomona and surrounding areas for SoCal and a little more Oregon, Washington for the Northwest campus in terms of the clinical rotations and involvement. Um, we offer longitudinal tracks, which are kind of interesting. You can flavor your education by being involved with different clubs, another tagline here. But the longitudinal tracks um, include things like rural medicine, global medicine, lifestyle medicine is one we have that not every school's offer, kind of nutrition medicine, cooking classes. You can do business in medicine, military medicine, et cetera, on top of your base curriculum, which we'll look at actually, which is kind of a systems-based approach. You then choose to be involved with a few clubs if you want, and you can flavor it additionally with the option of longitudinal tracks and research opportunities. Um, we'll take a look at the curriculum and we'll go back through. So systems-based, block-based approach. Um, you have one core block going about, about four per year. So kind of quarters. You'll go, for example, through a cardiovascular block for six weeks. Um, during that time, you are being taught by your family medicine professors, uh, clinical medicine, by your anatomy professors, uh, your OMM professors, and then you have all of your kind of science faculty. So they are all working together to teach you a systems block for six to eight weeks, at the end of which is an exam week. Um, and you will have your board style kind of ABC exam, and you're also going to have practical exams from all of those departments going on board. Um, after each exam week, we then have a conference week where you can explore things outside the normal curriculum. Um, guest speakers come in, and should you need, there's an opportunity to retake any portion of the exam you didn't yet get through to then move on. So we end up with about a 93% graduation rate from people coming on board, and we actually are sitting at 100% match rate this year for both campuses. Um, First year systems is gonna focus on the normal functions. You actually cover all the systems your first year. And then your second year, you go through all the body systems again, but now it's more pathology, diagnosis, treatment. So dual pass, everything goes through. And beside that, you are preparing for the boards in the ISSM course. So uh, you have your interprofessional education, your service learning, your board prep, and then your base systems-based approach those first two years. Third year core rotations, you can look on the website and I'll try to post a link during the Q&A if anybody wants to see it. Um, core rotations means eight of your 12 months during your third year are core rotations. You have to do one month of family medicine, peds, ob gyn et cetera. Oh, a mammal might be different from the MD side. You have a few electives and one vacation month somewhere in the mix. We try to put you primarily with one hospital system your third year, so you do not have to travel too far. Except less, your, your electives could pull you further afield. Um, so 
you will choose one core hospital, Pacific Northwest, mostly Pacific Northwest, although about 15 or 20 of our students are coming back down to, I think it's Palm Springs, Bakersfield, where we have some California availability to do rotations third year. Your fourth year, again, you end up traveling more, and that depends on the specialty you're pursuing, on the residencies you're applying to, because then you're setting up things called audition rotations, and we have our career development office to help you with preparation, application, interviews, and that entire process, and, and set you up where you need to be. Um, placement by specialty, this is one year ago. Um, we were third in the nation this year, MD or DO, uh, for a percentage of students going into primary care. Um, that being said, we still have a good number going into specialty fields, um, and we can talk about that more if there are questions in any direction. Um, on, on average, over the last decade, I think we're about 99% match rate, and this last year having 100% on both campuses was, was pretty special. Um, we are looking at about 10,000 alumni out there. And this is kind of the application side. We'll get 10,000 applications, but our two campuses handle things separately. If you're interested in Oregon and California, you are gonna check the box for both campuses because we have admission teams on both sites to select who they'll interview over the course of the cycle. Um, average students looking at a three, six something GPA, um, 508, 509 MCAT. You have to have a 500 get mixed. You do need a 3.0 GPA to kind of move forward in the secondaries. But there are other ways, you know, if you come out of undergraduate with a lower than 3.0 GPA, you can still open the door by doing post back classes or master's level work and still get in. Um, we can walk through scenarios. Um, ideal candidate. To get to the secondary, you have to check the basic academic boxes. Um, then you're looking at getting a certain level of clinical exposure. We expect you to be out there and have a couple hundred plus hours of volunteering or work paid or unpaid experience in the clinical world, kind of patient involvement or physician awareness. Um, we also love to see other volunteer experiences, leadership, things like that. Um, it doesn't mean you have to stop being yourself. You could still be a musician or a student athlete and be a great candidate. And we recognize the time commitment to other successful uh, endeavors. And if you have a balanced existence, that's good. We want you to continue doing that in med school and we'll support and look for good candidates from all of those areas. Um, get in touch. I'm going to cruise it along because, you know, half the information I could touch on was already mentioned in the previous presentation. So I'd love to go to Q&A and see where you guys direct us. Um, here's my basic information. I'll post it again in the chat shortly, but uh, let's get going and I'm excited to hear from you guys. So at this time, if you have any questions, uh, please put into the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask our two uh, rep representatives, Luke and Michael, your questions. And then I actually have got a couple of questions myself. <laughs> it's always great and interesting to hear from admissions folks. Okay, yeah, and I you know that uh, it's uh, quite a, a task, you know, as you review applicants uh, to maximize uh, a, what to do to help students maximize their chances of, of getting into med medical school. Let me start with, uh, let's see in the chat. What are the cost of uh, your programs? So Luke, um, start. I, I'm unmuted already. Sorry, Michael. I, we're okay. sitting, I think, at 64000 tuition. We are private. There's no in-state or out-of-state given. Um, there's a number of scholarship opportunities out there to talk about, but we're about 64000 right now for tuition. Yeah, ours is going to be uh, about 250000 for the for the total cost of our program, which is 25,000 per semester over the course of 10 semesters. Okay, so there's a couple of questions here. What is the percentage of your students who get accepted to a residency uh, within their first attempt? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead and start on this one. Um, so we matched at 97% uh, in, in 2023, 96% uh, in, in 2022. So we're pretty consistent there um, in, in the mid-high 90% uh, for, for residency. So if you guys are familiar with residency match, what happens is people apply. There's what's called match week that happens in March of each year for MD and DO schools. And people will match on Monday somewhere or they go into kind of a search and then by Friday they've found a home. So that match rate number has not to do with the first place on Monday, but rather by Friday, who has a home. So we were 100% this year. Um, but why I also like to point out there were 93% graduation rate from people who start the program to people to finish. So we had 93% of our people graduate and find a residency match 100% coming out of the program. Okay. It looks like there's uh, two questions from William. Okay. One is, um, if I took the AAMC preview exam, can I use it instead of the CASPER? 
So not, not as familiar. As were they a coma side? We, we do require the CASPER for our program. And then Michael? Um, we, we don't, we just require uh, MCAT and, and then a bachelor's. We don't, we're not gonna require that. Okay, great. And then there's a question again from William. Uh, question about ECFMG, okay? They re require now the OE OET. How can students be successful for that? Will Ross and ACU prepare students for the um, OET? I know this acronyms, and I'll be honest with you, I, I don't even know a lot of the stuff here <laughs> because you know, most counselors do not specialize within, at least community college counselors do not specialize in the health professions field. So if you don't mind, maybe um, within that context uh, of this question, may, uh, explain to both students or uh, counselors who may not have a lot of experience with this area, um, some of these acronyms. Yeah, I'm actually not familiar with the acronyms myself. Luke, do you know anything about that? I do not. Yeah, I said we are not an MD school, so some of these things are things we don't deal with directly. Okay. Uh, there's a question on uh, TOFU and uh, I I IOTs. Okay, to, uh, for Michael. Yeah, I would have to check back on that, uh, but I do know we do accept uh, international students. Uh, we know it's, it's really tough for international students to find a home for, for uh, medical school. Um, and so we love that we are kind of that place uh, for international students. Um, and I would just I kind of add to that, not necessarily the question, but just touching on international students uh, as a whole. We do have some pretty large scholarships available as well. Uh, Ross has a $100,000 international student scholarship, uh, while AUC, I believe they're $80,000. And that's for all international students. Um, so if I didn't mention that earlier, we do accept international students. I would have to uh, double check on, on exactly which of those. Uh, Western U, California accepts international students. Oregon does not right now. Um, we don't require TOEFL, but we do require two English writing courses as part of your coursework. And then, of course, part of the MCAT is going to show your English writing kind of understanding in that process. So we are looking for English writing and understanding, but through two English college credit uh, courses and then also through the MCAT. Uh, also, there's a question on um, EMT experience. So if a student does have EMT experience, okay, and they're applying for medical school, how does that benefit them? How is that evaluated within the context of their overall application? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just speak to our program. That, that, um, we, we love to see that, right? Um, that's just another kind of experience that you can you can speak on during your interview. Uh, and that's certainly something they're going to ask you about in the interview, right? Um, they're going to say, you know, I see that you were an EMT. What did you what did you gain from that experience? What did you learn from that? How do you think that better prepared you um, ultimately to become a physician? So uh, if you're if you're thinking about it, if you're training for that, uh, I would certainly say go ahead and do that. Um, it, it's definitely going to help your chances, I would assume, with 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 most schools. No, I, I think EMT is one of the better options you could go for. Uh, Carolina, Carolina, in that if you can find paid for experience in the clinical world, you know, that's great. You can volunteer. You don't have to be paid. I think EMT and Scribe might be two of the best options out there for many people. If you are going to go take a gap year or uh, have a summer program underway, you know, it's even CNA, just getting basic nursing level patient care experience is what we need. Um, but again, you don't have to do paid work. It could be volunteering a hospital. It could be volunteering your community and still start to count but you have to have a couple hundred of clinical related hours to get in the mix. And a lot of candidates do take gap years now. So some of your people applying beside you will have a couple thousand hours because they do EMT for a full year before they apply. You don't have to have that, but just realize you're competing against other people for seats. So yeah, EMT is a brilliant option. Yeah. And then my, my, my learning understanding of it's really the most important thing is direct patient care, you know, being able to interact with patients in whatever settings that you are at. You know? And I know that the missions folks, now they uh, they do view all your types of experiences and that really accounts for, for a lot. Okay? Um, there is another question for Aurora. Is there an age limit to be able to match with a residency? Not that I know of, no. No, I mean, the average age for our students is floats around, you know, 25, 26. I would say 10% of the students come into their 30s and beyond. And there's usually a couple students in their 40s or 50s coming through med school. Residency has no limitations. You're going for med school at this point. 
And then residences will interview you if you are a good applicant and go forward. So no, no age limitation. Okay. And there's a question from William, uh, Michael and Luke, if you don't mind just uh, reading it and see uh, if you could answer that question, because uh, I'm not really familiar much with the occupational English tests or any of that at all. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not too familiar. I'd have to, I'd have to check with my team and, and see about that. No, like, like I said, we do, even whether you had this test or not, which I'm not familiar with, you're going to have to have two college level writing English classes under your belt. And then your MCAT score, especially with like understanding and stuff, will show us kind of how well you're processing. So we don't have any separate English requirements beyond those. Um, as um, participants are maybe uh, gathering a few more questions, actually, I do have one or two questions for the both of you. Okay. Um, what's why, well, you know, there's, we always know that uh, for GPA, you know, there's always the average then within the range. Uh, for those students who have maybe at the lower end of the range, 3.0, 3.2 ish, and who actually end up getting to medical school, what were those characteristics that really made them stand out, you know, uh, with that little bit lower GPA? Okay. And I understand that GPA, there's you know, uh, multiple GPAs. It's overall GPA, GPA within the math, science, and physics, uh, trends within GPA, GPA within the last 60 units, the community college, the post back GPA. So I know that you are always looking at all that within context of how much work and so forth. Okay. But generally speaking, if a student does have not as a strong of a GPA, what are other things that they can do to one, either two part, two part question, one to improve their GPA <laughs> and number two, uh, things to really make them stand out uh, in order to really make them um, have a better chance at medical school if they don't have a strong GPA. Yeah, so, I, I would say, um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I would just say that uh, if you are trying to, you know, improve your, your uh, how, how you look academically, right? Obviously, a post back program is certainly not a bad option to go. Um, but uh, but beyond that, if you're just uh, if, if you're looking to apply for medical school um, and you're a little bit worried about your grades, I would say uh, you know take a gap year and try to get more experience, right? Um, for, especially you know for, for our program, that's uh, our, our committee weighs that very very heavily. Uh, and so maybe you do have a little bit lower GPA or a little bit lower MCAT score, uh, but you have mountains of experience. Uh, that's something they're really going to again weigh very heavily and something that um, is going to impact their decision. Uh, on whether they think you're going to be a, a good candidate for our program. Um, it just gives you something else to talk about during the interview, right? Uh, first, you know, we want to see that, that you have all this experience, but it gives you so much to, to speak to and a different experience to, to, to share about uh, during, during that interview with us. So I, I don't know that the interview is going to touch too much on your academic past. I mean, they, they could ask you questions. Um, our average is a 3.6. I think you need to show a, a year or two of success, especially towards the tail end of your academic career. So someone that gets in with a lower 3132 um, probably has at least one solid year at the end, more at that 35 level. Or um, if not, people will come back for post back for a year and people will get in with a sub 3.0 with us. But our caveat there is that they have completed at least a year of graduate level work at a 3.4 level. So if you dug yourself a hole your freshman sophomore year, which a lot of people do, then you have to kind of show success towards the tail end. If you've not shown success the whole way, but we don't want your money unless we think there's a really good chance of getting into the program. That makes sense. It's too expensive. It's too hard. We want to make sure that we can get everyone who starts theoretically through our program at 100% if we can. Um, so that's the reason the standards are there. Med school's not more difficult, they say, um, informationally speaking, than what you guys are doing in your undergraduate career. But it's just faster. It's a higher quantity. It's not taking 18 credits with like a full load at most institutions. It's taking 36 credits all the way through. So you need to show that you can handle at least a couple terms of full-time undergraduate work, science coursework, before you jump into double that and expect to succeed. Um, so that's the reason the numbers and stats are there. That's why we have the 500. That's why we have the 3.0, because below that statistically, the chances of people getting through the program go down very quickly. And it's just kind of unfair to take hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt and leave people hanging, I think. Thank you for the answer. Uh, it looks like there is another question, but um, I think it's a question uh, maybe a little bit um, 
better asked this way, okay? If uh, a student was from a foreign country and was a doctor already, now has moved to the U.S. and they're looking at becoming a doctor within the U.S., okay? Uh, what would be the process? Would they still have to take the MCAT, you know, or, or are there any um, shortcuts to that? And how can they apply for your very, various medical schools and so forth? Okay, Luke, do you want to take that first? I do. Um, there's no shortened access. I believe there are a couple programs in the nation that will allow candidates who are already physicians to have a, like a shortened three-year type track. We, we don't offer that. It's still just four years for anybody coming to the program, no matter their background prior. Um, so if you start, you start at the beginning, four years, you go out there. And yes, the check boxes are the same for every applicant. So everyone who applies to get in the program does need the MCAT, even if you're already a physician from another country. Yeah, same thing for us. Um, you know, there's there's no shortcuts or anything like that. Um, there's no way you can you know start in you know a couple of years into the program or take a shortened, uh, abbreviated version of the program or anything like that. You're going to be taking the same four years uh, as anyone else who, who's looking to to become a physician. Okay. 